The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. After Jesus had been born in Bethlehem, in Judah, during the reign of King Herod, some wise men came to Jerusalem from the east, where, where is the infant king of the Jews, they asked. We saw his star as it rose and have come to do him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was perturbed, and so was the whole of Jerusalem. He called together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people and inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. At Bethlehem in Judah, they told him. For this is what the prophet wrote. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, you are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come a leader who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men to see him privately, and he asked, what, asked them the exact date on which the star had appeared, and sent them on to Bethlehem. Go and find out all about the child, he said, and when you have found him, let, us, let me know, so that I too may go and do him homage. Having listened to what the king had to say, they set out, and there in front of them was a star that they had seen rising. It went forward and halted over the place where the child was. The sight of the star filled them with delight, and going into the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and falling to their knees, they did him homage. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, of gold and frankincense and myrrh. But they were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod and returned to their own country by a different way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Lord Jesus Christ. Of all the Christmas stories, I think this is the most magnificent. What are you all find? Huh? I mean, is, how, 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 you, how you explain this thing? You know, these, these men, you have to imagine they are wherever they are, and they see a star, and they decide to leave where they live in, and all their comforts, and travel, because they see a star. You would do that? Huh? Would you do that? Another here in here? I'm talking about leaving your comfortably air conditioned bedroom. <laughs> your nice cozy bed. And all the comfort creatures that you are accustomed to because you saw a star. That, that, that to me is one of the great, great mysteries of this Christmas season. I mean, as we have them here in, the, in our crest scene, you know, the, the shepherds are there, yes, and Joseph and Mary is there. And all the, the animals are there, but, but these three. And, and the other thing that we, we see is that after Jesus had been born, they, they come because they saw a star. So, so when did they see the star? It wasn't the day before, you know. Because these are men who come from the east, and they didn't have aeroplane or Maxi Taxi. So they would have seen the star at the moment, I imagine, in the moment of the conception of Jesus. That once the angel had spoken, and once the Jesus, Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, that, that at that moment, the, the sign in the heavens would have appeared. But what we are dealing with is not just a beautiful story from scripture in the nativity. We're also dealing with prophecy and its fulfillment. There's a, a text in the, in the book of Numbers of Balaam. You all remember Balaam? Yeah, he, his donkey was a little more famous than him, but that's another story. Balaam gives a prophecy 
And he says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but in the distant future. A star shall arise and a king shall come forth. So way, 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 way back, it was prophesied that somewhere in the distant future, a star shall arise. And that star arising will be the sign that God was doing something very different. Balaam was, was paid by, by a king to curse Israel and to, to bring upon them a curse from, from, from their gods. And, and no matter what the king tried, Balaam's prophecy was for Israel and prophesied that in the distant future, the star will arise. And, and when it arises, something new will happen on the earth. Oh, we, we have the, the prophecy from Isaiah. Now, this is Isaiah 60, and, and so the people have lived in, in terrible exile for, for 70 years, and it, it was dreadful it was in, in every single way. They've now returned to back home. They're now trying to rebuild Jerusalem and, 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 and their cities and, and, and trying to, to make something of the pillage and of the life that, that had been completely destroyed. And, and, and also understand the meaning of, of these years in exile that they lived. And in the midst of all of that, the prophet says, Arise, shine out, Jerusalem, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is rising on you. Though the night still covers the earth and darkness is people, above you the Lord now rises. And above you, the glory appears. Nations come to your light, kings to your dawning brightness. And the prophecy in the darkest hour of, of Jerusalem's life, in the darkest hour of that city, is that Jerusalem will become a new Jerusalem. And the light that will come from that city will bring kings and will bring dormitories from, from all over the world. Lift up your eyes and look around you. All are assembling and coming towards you. Your sons from far away, your daughters being tenderly carried. At this sight, you will grow radiant, your heart throbbing and full, since the riches of the seas will flow to you and the wealth of the nations will come to you. You know, we have to start understanding something that I think is vital from a, a Christian perspective. It is sometimes in the darkest hour that God gives the brightest word and the brightest moment of hope. Israel was in its darkest hour here. And, and, and what came forth from Israel, or what came forth from the prophet, was a, a ray of great hope a light that you could not see or make sense of when you looked around at the desolation of, of Jerusalem and, and the trouble of rebuilding it. You couldn't make sense of this word from Isaiah at the moment it was given because of how dark the experience of the people were in that time. And yet the word was for its time and for its season. And as a same Isaiah says, God's word never comes and falls on the earth without its purpose being fulfilled. These days where hope is so hard to hold, what we have to see is that the many, 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 many ways in which the Old Testament is a prophecy of the New Testament. And the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old. And when you start seeing that, you start understanding that even if we live in a time that might seem to you to be dark, God is true to his word. You know the old people say he might put on, but he don't sleep. He might put on pajamas, but God don't sleep. God is true to his word. So as we come to this, this wonderful story, you know, the, the three magi, 
And you know, the, the, the New Testament text does not speak about kings. You all know that. Huh? You know that. And we like to sing, we three kings are oriental and all the rest of it. But they don't say kings. They say, they say magi, which is magus or, or, or wise men. That, that's, we get the kings because of, of Isaiah, who speaks about kings coming to you. And, and so they, even, even the interpretation of the event is interpreted always from the prophets and, and from the Old Testament. And so the Magi, it was expected that the kings would be Magi or Magus. But as we see in the case of Herod here, that doesn't always fall true. So we have three, well, we have some men. Because they don't even tell us three, eh? We have some men who have come from wherever they have come from. And they come to Jerusalem as it's prophesied. And what they meet in Jerusalem is not a, ma a magi, not a, not a wise man. What they meet in Jerusalem is an imposter king. Because Herod was not even of the line of David. In fact, Herod was not even uh, a Jew. He, he was an Edomite, which is a, a half Jew and half a person from, from, from another part of, of, of the world. And, 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 and he himself had no right to be king. And that's why when the, 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 the men came, these wise men came, and they said, where is the infant king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and have come to do him homage. When Herod heard this, he was perturbed, and the whole of Jerusalem with him. That's an interesting scripture. Herod was perturbed. You would think he should be happy. But why is he perturbed? He's perturbed because he is not a true king. He's not a wise man. He's holding on to power by, by force. And, and he's not ruling his people wisely. And he's a despot. And he's willing even to kill and sacrifice his, his family for the sake of his holding on to power. Because he's perturbed because in the face of the true king, you have to be perturbed. You have to be perturbed. And whenever God appears as, as he do, did through the angel to the little girl in, in, in Nazareth, the first thing he says is, do not be afraid. Because whenever God really comes, you should be afraid. You should be terrified. You should be terrified because what, what, what you meet when you meet the living God, what you meet is a death to your ego because the ego can't stand anymore. It, it, it is a pretense. It is an imposter. It, it has no real place or power. And, and so it is unmasked for what it is. And so Herod is perturbed, and the whole of Jerusalem with him. What we have in this story is a prophecy being fulfilled. And what is the prophecy? The prophecy is that the, the nations will come and bow down before God. And we see that in our, in our, our psalm. And the refrain of our, of our psalm today is, all nations shall fall prostrate before you, O Lord. All nations, all nations shall come and bow down and worship before you, O God. The, the prophecy of the psalm, the prophecy of Isaiah, which, which is, we have its first fulfillment here with our, our, our wise men, is something that continues to be waiting on you and I. Do we bow down before him? You hear my question? Do we really? So the word there, the word there, so in the beginning it says, where is the king of the infant king of the Jews, they asked. We saw the stars that rose, and we have come to do him homage. We have come to worship him. We have come to worship him. And then down at the end of it, it says, and they, 
and falling on their knees, they did him worship. They came because they knew that this infant king is, is, is more than just uh, another baby being born. They, they came looking for this one because they knew this one is special. And their first inclination is to worship him. I want you to hear that. To do what? To worship him. I could imagine all along this journey, these men talking about this star and what it could mean. And, and, and what, what do you think we will find? I mean, you're talking about months of travel, huh? You know how much conversation about this? And, and the distillation of the conversation is that when, when they reach to Jerusalem, the first thing they want to do is find this king because they come to worship him. Now, you only worship God alone. You only worship God alone. Later on in the, in the scriptures, we would see Satan saying to Jesus, bow and worship me now, and, and you wouldn't have to die on a cross. We, we make this thing real, real simple. And Jesus says, you only worship God alone. And so what they came to, come to, to realize in their long travel towards Jerusalem is that they were coming to God. And that they, they, the child that they sought and, and, and God was the same thing. And so when they came, they came to worship him. They came to worship him. And it's intri intriguing, you know. If you look at the text, it's, it's such a beautiful text because they came asking about the infant king in Jerusalem. Then they had to read, so all the, all the while they were reading from, the, from the, the text of nature. And the text of nature got them to, to Jerusalem. One could say it got them to the right cathedral, but not to the right pew. It got them to Jerusalem. But now they have to read from the text of sacred scripture. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, and you are by no means among the leaders of Judah, and out of you will come a leader who will shepherd my people Israel. They now must read from sacred scripture to find not just the right place, but the right location for the king. And having found him and the mother, Falling on their knees, they did him homage. This is so important. The whole of our, our tradition has one end, that we come to worship God. That's the only end of it. When, when Moses was asked to lead the people out of Israel, it was so that he may teach the people how to worship God. Jesus to the woman at the well a time will come when we will worship in spirit and in truth. And the worship of God is really what everything is about. The whole tradition is that we will come to worship God. What does that mean? What does that really mean for us? These wise men came, they bowed, they worshipped. And then they gave gifts in generosity. And you have to hear the, the Catholic liturgy here. We make our journey towards here. Then we, we read from the sacred, sacred scripture. Then we bow and we worship. Then we open our hearts and we give gifts generously in the offertory. You have to hear the whole structure of the sacred liturgy here in this text. And, and what's so important is if, if, if these men understood that the only appropriate response was to worship, we who know Jesus Christ find it hard sometimes to wake up on a Sunday morning. Find it hard to give God an hour, hour and a half in a, in a week. Find it hard to wake up 
and, and pray during, during the day. Find it hard to worship him. We find it difficult to worship him. The, the wise men were wise. And I suppose we can say that wise people worship God. And the fool says, there is no God. The challenge of the wise men to you and me is asking of us in the journey that we have made so far, have we come to the same conclusions that they have come to? That this one who was born in the manger, born of a woman, not the subject of, a, of law, this one who was born, of whom the angels spoke and sang glory to God in the highest heavens. That this one that we celebrate, that this one is God. Have we come to that conclusion? Because if we come to the conclusion that this one is God, then the only appropriate response is to? Is to? Let me hear you now. Is to worship him. And not only to worship him, but to be generous and bring our gifts to him. In their case, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And, and, and when we find it difficult to be generous to God and to his church and to his kingdom, it's because we find it difficult to really see this little one as God. And really to understand who it is we come before. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Mighty One of Israel, the Great I Am. And everything in the scriptures points to this one single moment where we must now respond. They responded in worship and generosity. How are you? going to respond. Amen.